All right, what is up and welcome back to the Build A Better You podcast. I'm your host, Austin Chan. And today we are going to be going over a quick little intro to weightlifting. So if you're new to lifting weights or if you just don't know where to start or if you have been doing weightlifting for some time now, but you're not seeing the exact results you want, then here is a kind of a step-by-step guide on how to uh, program your own workout program as well as what exercises to pick. And obviously, I'm not going to be like creating your cust- a custom design program for you because this is the stuff that people pay me for. So obviously, if you want something in more of that depth, then definitely check out my online coaching program. Uh, link is in the show notes. It's just Austin Chan Fitness, I think it's uh, slash online coaching. But yeah, go ahead and check that out if you do want more in-depth and personalized help. But other than that, let's get straight into it. So firstly... Uh, weight weightlifting can seem very intimidating for especially those who just uh, are new to the whole fitness thing and are just getting started into into fitness in general. So, yeah, a lot of people, uh, the top fears I hear about weightlifting are definitely like people who, a lot of the reasons why people just stick to cardio is because they don't want to make a fool of themselves in the weight room or they just don't know where to start or they are just scared of hurting themselves. So yeah, hopefully in this podcast, um, just by introducing some of these concepts, this can help you get a better idea of where to start. Or even if you have been doing this for a while and you're not seeing the results you want, hopefully this can help guide you into the right direction in order to help you start seeing results. Because a lot of people, even though they know weightlifting is good for them, even though they are, they have taken that first step and gotten themselves introduced to weightlifting, a lot of people still aren't like doing everything properly because there are a lot of variables even in just weightlifting itself like you have to dive into if you do want to start seeing the results you have to really dial things in you can't just walk in uh do a bunch of random machines and expect results there are some things that you have to pay attention I'm obviously i'm not trying to make this super complex i'm, I'm going to be trying to make this as simple as possible but just know that Every, I think everything in life is not as simple as it seems. Obviously, you can dive into every anything you, you find in life. You can dive into it a, with a lot more depth and a lot more detail and really dial things in and get uh, much better and also more results if you were to take a more structured apro- approach rather than just like free-balling everything. So without further ado, let's get into it. So uh, firstly... In terms of weightlifting, if you don't know what movements to start, here are just general seven movements that I like to work on for most people who are just getting started in weightlifting. And also, if you just work on these movements in general and get really strong and get really good at doing them, you're going to have a pretty impressive physique and also you're going to have pretty um, healthy fitness and overall health levels just because these are very basic movement patterns that if you strengthen, you'll strengthen the majority of the muscles in your body as well as be able to develop them in order to look better because some people like to look better. So yeah, nothing wrong with that. But yeah, first movement is gonna be your squat movement. So this is basically any type of movement that involves squats. Like it doesn't have to be like a free body weight squat. This can be anything from goblet squats, barbell squats, uh, leg press, if you think about it, your a leg press is basically just a squat, but it's done in a machine where the uh, range of motion, the path, and the resistance itself is just moving in more of a fixed path rather than your squat where you really have to do a lot of the controlling. And uh, my personal favorite for this is going to be the hack squat just because it, it is a machine And that you can really like strap yourself in and just really go at it and train super hard and not have to worry too much about form breakdown because as you get more fatigued obviously it's going to be harder to maintain form now just as a general side note this i mean this applies to squats but it also applies to many other weightlifting movements in general like the whole free weights versus machines debate um honestly there's nothing wrong with doing either free weights or machines because if you think about it like a lot of people the the main argument a lot of people make for doing choosing free weights over machines is because they talk about the quote stabilizing muscles when really 
if you ask this person what what do they mean by stabilizing muscle they usually can't name what the stabilizing stabilizing muscle they're talking about and the truth is there really is no stabilizing muscle the fact and here's the truth on that the fact of the matter is is that when you're doing like let's say a leg press versus a free body weight squat the main difference is that obviously your quads are going to be working they're going to be the main movers of doing the squat and so when you're doing a body weight squat although you're generating a lot of force with your quads in order to do that squat your quads also have to do a lot of um, control in, in terms of balance and also stabilizing in order to you know stabilize you so you don't fall over while you're doing the squat whereas a leg press you can really hammer out the quads and really and your quads don't have to do much output in terms of stabilization so that because it doesn't have to ex expend as much energy doing stabilization it can expend more energy actually producing force and like really nailing and pushing the weight whereas a squat it has to use some of its muscular output to stabilize rather than just producing pure force so again there's nothing wrong with doing free weights versus machines it's just that it trains it more so it doesn't exactly change the way that the muscle is being trained but rather it changes the the neuromuscular aspect of it so your your central nervous system your brain your spinal cord everything obviously it branches down from your brain to your spinal cord and then from your spinal cord all the nerves come out and you know innervate within your muscles and that's basically how you get movement how you control your muscles how you get feedback from and to your muscles and so basically when you're doing a lot of free weight movements it's just pretty much teaching your brain how to control the weight with your muscles whereas uh, doing machines it's just a little bit less of that like you don't have to do as much stabilization but in terms of your muscle just being worked it's um, I would say in terms of free weights, it's to a lesser degree you're, because your muscles have to use some of their uh, force and their output and their energy to stabilize the, the weight. That means it can't produce as much force just purely contracting and producing like actual force to move the weight, which is why you can go a lot heavier on machines versus free weights because your muscle, you can actually have more energy, have more output in order to move more weight on machines because you're not having to create that stability within your muscles. So that's just kind of a quick like go over of free weights versus machines. Again, there's nothing wrong with either or. In fact, I think if your goal is to maximize or build uh, as much muscle as possible, then definitely machines are a better pick. This is why a lot of bodybuilders do machines. And not, there's nothing wrong with free weights themselves. You can certainly uh, still build a significant amount of muscle using free weights. It's just that it depends on, you know, what movements you choose. It's a, it, it depends on why you're choosing that specific movement. But honestly, you can build a significant amount, significant amount of muscle using both. There's nothing wrong. Like just because you use machines doesn't mean you're magically going to like not build as much muscle or like build cool stabilizing muscles or that you're going to get less gains. In fact, I would argue you can even get the same amount of gains or you can get more incorporating a combination of free weights and machines depending on what you want to get out of your workout. So yeah, there's that. Uh, we just finished talking about squats. So squats are basically going to be mainly targeting your quads. I mean, you do get a little bit of glute activation from like squat movements, but primarily it's going to be a quad dominant movement. And so yeah, you cannot build a good pair of glutes just specifically squatting, which is which brings me to the next movement is hip hinging. And so a lot of people think hip hinging and squat are very similar movements, especially when I tell a lot of people to show me what a deadlift is. They'll get a lot of quad activation, which makes it look more like a squat rather than a hip hinge. And so the main difference is that hip hinge, it's, it's in the name. So you have to think about hinging back at the hips. So uh, obviously I can't demo it onto a podcast here, but basically the main hip hinge movement that I use for a lot of people is just a simple RDL because I think a full stop deadlift, it starts involving a lot of other muscles. And like, once you kind of get past like the low where if you were imagining if you're holding a barbell or a dumbbell, if you got below, like well below your knees, 
you would start involving other muscles. It wouldn't really be more of a hip dominant exercise. And so obviously hip hinge, we want that to be a hip dominant exercise. And so for the for any type of hip hinge, usually a few cues that I like to give are, you know, stand up tall, keep your chest up, and then just focus. And you want to maintain like a neutral spine. So keeping your upper body stacked and tall. So you don't want to be like arching your back in any sort of direction. And then from there, just think about pushing your hips back. And basically, a uh, real little analogy I like to use is that if you think about those like little tippy bird things, uh, yeah, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Those The little tippy birds that like kind of tip down and come back up and they dip their beak in the water. Usually a lot of people know what I mean by then. But yeah, those little tippy birds, basically you want your body to be moving in that motion and you just want to be shooting your hips back. You don't want to be actively thinking about bending over, but just simply pushing your hips back and then letting your upper body fall forward naturally just because... Yeah, it's not necessarily the same movement as bending over because as you're bent, if you're just simply thinking about bending over, you're gonna get a lot of lower back stress, which is what we don't want. We want your hips to be handling the stress because it can do that. It ha can handle a lot more weight and load versus your lower back, you're just asking for injury. So yeah, hip hinging. So squats for quads, for the front of your legs, hip hinge is basically a very hip dominant movement like the name says. So it's a lot of glutes, a lot of hamstrings, depending on how you structure and perform the movement. And the next movement we have is any type of single leg movement. And now I know you might be asking, oh, uh, isn't it just enough to do like bilateral or double leg movements? I would argue no, because single leg movements help you a lot in terms of training the stability function of your legs. And especially your legs, you want a lot of stability because you are... I would, I would argue that if you are walking around, if you, if you just get a lot of movement in general, you're going to be walking on one leg a lot. Because think about it every time you walk. Every time you walk, you have to balance on one leg as you swing that other leg through. So balance is actually very important for everyday life. Like just because you're not balancing on one leg on a freaking bosu ball, like doing some weird movement, doesn't mean you don't need to train balance and stability. So that's, this is where single leg movements come in like a lot. So yeah, any type of single leg movement and uh, single leg movements, there are a lot of them, but I would say my top favorites are probably uh, step ups. So yeah, in terms of progression, I'm giving, you, I'm giving you my secret sauce here in terms of programming. So yeah, take some notes. Uh, yeah, in terms of progression, for a lot of clients, I like to do step ups because you're you're starting from a pretty stable you're starting on two legs and you're just basically stepping up you don't really have to work on balancing too much it's just that step and then you come up and so it doesn't require a lot in terms of stability which is super easy to get started if you're not used to like just resistance training or weightlifting in general and then obviously you can load this by holding some dumbbells in your hands and then the next progression would be reverse lunges because as you're performing that reverse lunge, you're starting from a very stable place of staying on two legs, and then you'll lunge backwards into it. And so you're starting from stability into that unstable and really getting to work on that balance uh, versus other va lunge variations. And also because you're reverse lunging, the force is more so backwards if you think about it, because you're moving, you're shifting your weight backwards in reverse lunge. So. It gets a lot of glute activation and it's definitely a lot of people do have weak glutes and so that definitely helps strengthen the glutes and a lot of people also have knee problems so if you have knee problems definitely starting out with with reverse lunges and as you strengthen those glutes as you as you strengthen that lunging movement pattern then you can progress into more knee dominant lunge variations and which brings me to the next variation is going to be walking lunges and so as you can imagine Walking lunges, you're gonna be walking into it, so you're gonna be moving forward. And so, at, because the force is going forward, this gets a lot of knee stress. So this is definitely something you should do after mastering the previous lunge variations. And also you get a lot of instability because you are actually like stepping into it because you're starting from standing on two legs and you kind of have to step into that instability. So you do have to provide a lot of stability into a walking lunge because you're basically standing on one or 
yeah, you're standing on one leg and you're trying to like push yourself forward on that one leg. So it's a lot of instability. Whereas reverse lunge, you kind of have to step back into it, which like, yeah, it, it's just easier to control. Whereas a walking lunge is more of an advanced variation. Oh, I did forget to mention in there, uh, split squats. Definitely, if you have done split squats, those are super freaking hard. However, I, I do want to say because you're not necessarily moving anywhere, that it can be an easier variation of the single leg movements. Personally, I would stick them right in between um, step ups and reverse lunges because you're not really getting any sort of like stepping back or stepping into it. So there's really no, there, there's a lot less loss of like stability because you're basically just planting two feet onto a surface and then you are kind of performing that lunge movement but you're not going anywhere so you don't really you you have more stability you can stay you can stand still um like during the movement and you don't really have to like really focus on balancing so yeah split squats are a very good one as well and so that about covers it for the single leg movements and obviously oh yeah forgot to mention obviously you can shift these to a more quad dominant or a hip dominant exercise so the more you push your knees forward and get what's called knee flexion. So knee flexion is basically closing the angle between your shin and your thigh. So as you get more knee flexion, and keep in mind that uh, if you do have limited ankle mobility, you will find that your hip, your, not your hip, your, what am I saying? Your heel will shift uh, off the ground if you do have limited ankle mobility. And this is something to, that just comes as you like strengthen yourself, or for some people, it's just, it helps a lot if you have like a pair of wedges that you can elevate your heels on. But yeah, quad dominant, you want to be shifting that weight, or not shifting that weight. You want to be driving that knee as forward as possible, really getting that maximal knee flexion and you'll definitely feel it. Whereas if you want more hip and glute dominant uh, exercise, you want to, you want that shin angle to be as vertical as possible. You're obviously, you want a little bit of knee flexion because your quads do stay, you're not going to get no quads and you're not going to get no glutes in either or variations. It's just that you're shifting one muscle group to do more of the work versus the other. And I do want to make that clear. So yeah, for the glute dominant variation, you do want to yeah, shift your weight a little bit back, keep that knee close to vertical, and then really think about sitting back in the movement and you want to go for what's called hip flexion. So that's basically the angle between your thigh and your torso, your upper body. So yeah, that's getting maximal hip flexion to really stretch out the glutes. And then hip extension is just driving forward or driving up. And oh yeah, I do also want to make it clear that squats, leg presses, all that kind of stuff do not work the hamstrings. I forgot to mention this. Uh, yeah, I just got reminded of this because we are talking about like single leg movements for the most part. A lot of them are just really like close to squat variations. Obviously, you can do like a single leg RDL, which is a hip hinge movement, a single leg hip hinge movement. But yeah, for the most part, squats do not, not even for the most part, it, it, this is the definite fact. Squats do not train the hamstrings because the hamstrings are called what it's, it's called a by I believe it's by articulate muscle so that means it crosses two different joints so the hamstrings three there are four heads uh three of them go from the back of your knee all the way up to like the the back of I think it's the back or the side of your hip and that's why you can train a lot of like you can that's why you can train your hamstrings doing hip hinges and yeah because it crosses like that joint so if you just simply bend the hips, you're getting a lot of stress on the hamstrings. And whereas there's one head that only works in knee flexion. So knee flexion, again, it's closing the angle between your, your uh, calf and your thigh. So if you were to just like sit down and do a leg curl and, you know, bend your knee, you're doing that. That's what knee flexion is. So yeah, three of the hamstrings cross the hip joint. So it gets trained in hip hinging movements, but there's one head that gets neglected. If you're only doing hip hinges, you have to do some sort of knee flexion or the closing between the angle between your shin and your thigh in order to train that one hamstring head. So yeah, there's that. And oh yeah, uh, I went on a little tangent and I totally forgot where I was going, but yeah, now I remember. So yeah, squats do not train the hamstrings because 
you're getting simultaneous knee flexion and hip flexion, which, yeah, so if you think about this, and if this is hard to visualize, I'm gonna to try to explain to you right now, but simultaneous knee flexion. So if you think about in terms of a squat, you're getting simultaneous knee bend and hip bend. So, so yeah, as you bend your knees, you're also like bending your hips and really sitting back into movement. And because you're doing both of those motions at the same time, the hamstrings stay the same length because they cross both of those joints. So that's why hamstrings do not get worked in a squat or a leg press. And you might have heard or seen that somewhere, sometime along the way from some influencer, but this is totally not the case. And then onto the next movement is going to be some sort of vertical pulling motion. So this could be anything from chin-ups, pull-ups, any sort of pull-down motion. And yeah, these are gonna be hard to mimic without a gym, unless obviously if you can do like chin-ups for days, but yeah, something, some movements I would recommend are a lot of pull-downs. And if you do have a home gym setting, I do recommend picking up some like pulley systems. I know because of the whole COVID thing, the, definitely uh, home gyms have boomed for the past year. So yeah, picking up some like pulley systems or even like a functional trainer setup if you have the money to afford that definitely getting some pull downs it just hits the muscles the back muscles at a different angles so it definitely helps out a lot and in terms of muscles worked so this really depends on how you want to how you're structuring out the movement and so it all really depends on how far out your elbows are and in terms of where you where you're pulling your elbows back this is going to work a variety of muscles but generally speaking if you want to hit the the lats or the big kind of like the ones that were like, if you see bodybuilders flex and they really get that V taper, those are pretty much what the lats are. And so if you really want to work on the lats, you want to make sure that the arm angle, you're keeping it close to your body and really driving the elbows down towards your hips and do not pull past the body because the lats don't do this. Once you pull past your body, you're going to get a lot of other back muscle activation. So yeah, lats, just think about elbows close to your side driving your elbows down towards your hips and don't pull past the body and then if you want your upper back muscles you'll bring your elbows out a little bit more and then depending on how far you bring out your elbows you're gonna you're gonna work out a variety of back muscles uh which i won't get too much into but uh in terms 45 degrees is gonna be a lot of, like rhomboids and rear delts and anything further out than that is going to be like your teres major your teres minor but yeah, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, just like play around with it, see how each movement feels for you. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, I think as John Meadows said, he's a professional bodybuilder. If you, when you're training your back, you just want to think about elbows and angles. So wherever your elbows track, wherever, however out far out your elbows um, are out, then that's going to determine which back muscle you're going to be primarily targeting and again like i said previously just because you're you're uh changing out, out the angle does not mean you're not working a particular muscle it's just that you are going to be targeting a specific muscle more versus other muscles and especially if you want to think about muscle building when you want to pick movements you want to be picking movements that target specific muscles the best that means that they're doing the majority of the work that way you can actually stress whatever muscle you were trying to work and then that pushes it to grow. Whereas if you just pick movements that work out a lot of muscles, then you're just basically watering down the movement and all of the muscles don't really get a significant amount of tension, which I'm gonna go into later or a lot of specific stress. So it's not going to grow as much as it could if you were just picking movements that specifically target that muscle. And so, yeah. That about covers it for vertical pull, uh, horizontal pull. Uh, that's gonna be any sort of rowing movement. And again, like I said, with back, it really depends on elbows and angles. And yeah, in terms of horizontal pull, most horizontal pulls are gonna be working like lats, uh, off the top of my head, uh, rear delts and rhomboids and all that. Everything else requires like a different angle, but yeah, you can still target a lot of muscles doing vertical and horizontal pulling. It's just, again, it depends on where those elbows track and what angle or how far the angle is from your body to your elbow. And now that we got the pulling movements, we have to go to the pushing movements as well. 
So we have your vertical push and your horizontal push. So vertical push is going to comprise of any pushing movement that you're pushing overhead. So these, this will encompass a lot of shoulder movements. Uh, yeah, typically a lot of shoulder movements. You get a little bit of upper chest, but mainly if you're doing any sort of vertical pushing, you want it to be primarily shoulders. And then, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, any pulling movement is going to involve your back primarily, but it's also going to have your biceps as kind of a synergist because your body, your muscles work in a like complex like system where it likes to recruit certain amount of muscles because those are the muscles that perform the movement most efficiently and your body loves being efficient. So yeah, any sort of pulling movement will involve your back and your biceps. Your biceps are going to be the secondary muscle, which is why for pushing and pulling movements, you don't want to start out with doing your arms, you're doing your biceps or triceps because these smaller muscles assist a lot in doing that bigger movement. So you don't want to fatigue those smaller muscles. And then by the time they fatigue, and if you want to do those larger compound movements, then your smaller muscles are going to be fatigued and you can't go as heavy as you can, as you would have been able to go. And you're not going to be able to train as hard as you could. And you're not going to be stressing your muscles enough, which ultimately leads to not having as much results as you originally wanted to. So yeah, uh, do your compounds before your single joint movements. And uh, yeah, uh, vertical, yeah, vertical and horizontal pushing. So pushing movements are mainly going to involve either your chest and your triceps or your shoulders and your triceps. So vertical push, any sort of pushing overhead is going to involve shoulders and triceps and a little bit of upper, upper chest. But mainly you want your horizontal horizontal pushing to involve your chest more because you're pushing horizontally and your chest does that movement the best. And yeah, and in terms of chest development, you can do multiple angles. There's the upper chest or the clavicular portion of the chest where you can, when you're, if you're doing any sort of incline pressing, that's gonna work that there. Any sort of like mid chest, not really, I don't wanna say mid chest, that's an inaccurate term that's been used, but it's basically the sternal portion is basically, yeah, kind of like, if you think about your clavicular as your upper, your sternal is gonna be like your mid, not necessarily like the inner part of your chest, that part you can't work because all the all of the fibers of the your pecs are attached to your to the center portion of your chest, but your sternal would be like yeah, like the middle in terms of like you have upper, middle, and lower. And then you have your lower chest, which is also known as the costal pecs. So costal, I think it's referring to the ribs. So basically, yeah, it's the one where it's like attaches most to like the ribs to the lower portion of your chest. So yeah, you want to be hitting your pecs at different angles in order to get maximal development. And yeah, in terms of movements for uh, vertical push and horizontal push, I like to do a lot of overhead shoulder pressing for vertical Push, yeah, basically any sort of shoulder press. But personally, I really like dumbbells because it kind of gives you that better range of motion to train each part independently. Whereas a barbell, you're just kind of fixed to it and you really have to work yourself around the bar. Whereas dumbbells, it's a lot more flexibility and you don't fix yourself to any particular like straight bar, which can lead to a lot injuries down the road if you are more injury prone and also if you don't have a very symmetrical body. And in my case, I do not. And I've racked up a few injuries over my lifting career just from working with a lot of barbells ever since i switched to dumbbells i've never felt better i've never been able to feel like i i've i felt like i've been able to push more weight while also remaining injury free so there's that but yeah horizontal push any sort of chest pressing movement really machines free weights all that uh have at it and I don't want to like list any specific movement in general because I do want you to figure this out for yourself because ultimately if you want longevity, if you want this to be sustainable and long-term and you want to make a habit out of this and you want to do this for the rest of your life, ultimately you're going to have to figure this out for yourself. And I can only do so much. I mean, I can tell you the movements, but ultimately think about, I don't want you to think about exercises for working specific movement patterns, but I want you to think about the movement patterns themselves and think about how can I best replicate this? How can I best understand my body in order to pick movements that will train these specific movement patterns and be able to get what I want out of doing the, out of like, yeah, doing a program or writing a program or 
like writing a workout for yourself. So now that we got all the seven movements out of the way, we're going to talk about what is the main driver of muscle growth? Like what, like what do you have to do to get your muscles to grow? And basically I've got a few points here. So the main one's going to be mechanical tension. So what is mechanical tension? Sounds like a pretty fancy term, right? So mechanical tension is basically the idea that your muscles, they don't know what weight it is you're lifting. Every day you go into the gym, they don't know what weight it is. They only know tension. So you, if you apply some sort of force, your muscles are going to have to work against it. And basically mechanical, getting enough mechanical tension is the ultimate goal of weightlifting. And in order to do this, you have to be training close or to what is called muscle failure. And muscle failure is basically to the point where you literally cannot force out another rep if you tried. It's training to that point where like, yeah, you like, you, you go all out and your muscles are basically at the point of quote failure. So in order to generate enough mechanical tension, you have to be training close to that point. As, I would, especially when you first start out, you, you have to get close, but as you get more and more advanced, as you start doing this more, you have to be training, you have to be training to failure just to get enough like effective reps. And so effective reps, oh uh, yeah, I can go on this tangent about this all day, but in effective reps is basically like, if you think about any sort of time you lifted weights, you know, the first five reps felt pretty, felt pretty easy. And then as you kind of get close and closer and closer to that point of muscle failure, you feel like your muscles are starting to burn more. You feel like it's hard to push yourself. You feel like you really have to try and like really grind out the reps. That's the point I'm talking about. Those are the reps that will like force you to grow. Those are the effective reps that will push your body to change. And if you want your muscles to grow, you have to be generating enough of what's called mechanical tension in this case. And mechanical tension is basically the point where you are activating enough muscle fibers. So I'm going to try to summarize this as much as possible. So in terms of like muscle recruitment, if you think about your muscles as like your muscle fibers as like a bunch of guys trying to pull a rope, pull a rope to move a huge object. So Obviously, if the object is very light, you just need one guy to pull on the rope. But as the object gets heavier and heavier, you need more and more people to come and pull on a rope. So if you think about your muscles as this way, like if you're lifting a super light weight, your body's not going to waste a ton of energy recruiting a bunch of muscle fibers just to lift a, light, lift a light load. It's going to recruit as least muscle fibers as possible because your body, as again, like I've said in previous podcasts, your body is lazy, it likes being efficient, it likes saving the most amount of energy. So your body's not going to recruit a bunch of muscle fibers, but as the weight gets heavier and heavier, your body has to get more and more guys to come pull on that rope and it has to recruit more and more of what's called motor units, which is what your service, your central nervous system kind of inserts all the nerves into your muscles. And then as the weight gets heavier and heavier, it has to activate more and more of those nerves and activate more and more muscle fibers. And so if you want to generate enough mechanical tension, you have to get enough of those guys to start pulling on the rope or lifting the weight. And so the only way to do this is by lifting relatively heavy weights and training close or to the point of failure. And again, you don't have to be training to failure, but you have to be training close to it. The newer you are, you can get away with training farther from failure, but as you get more and more advanced, you have to be getting closer to that failure point or even to that failure point. And so now that you have established that baseline, you have to also apply what's called progressive overload, which basically means to do more work over time. And so, yeah, you can be training close to that point, but eventually that point is going to get easier and easier. And you're going to have to keep pushing more and more because your body is going to adapt to whatever it is you put it through. And once it adapts, you have to either in, you have to increase that stimulus in order to keep training your body to grow more and adapt more. So that's basically what progressive overload is. Um, there are t a ton of ways to do progressive overload, but the main ones I like to say is to either increase the amount of weight you're lifting, um, do the same amount of weight for more reps or the most underrated one. And I think by far this one should be your main priority at first. It's doing the same amount of weight with the same amount of reps, but doing it with better form or technique. And truth be told, we all have room to improve on our technique. We all have yeah, some room for improvement, even myself included. Sometimes, you know, I don't like control the weight as much as I thought, as much as I 
could have and this is something it's like it's all, almost like an ever growing journey like you're never gonna have like perfect form of technique especially if you're lifting pretty heavy weight there's gonna be a little bit of form breakdown somewhere somehow just because you're lifting so heavy that sometimes you can't like focus on like pristine technique as you would if you're lifting like super lightweight so definitely focusing on progressive overload stressing your body over time and yeah this is something that if you don't push your body then it's not going to adapt it's something that you're going to have to get after and really push yourself if you want to see that change and growth and which brings me to, to my next point this is kind of a rant more than anything that i think like most people see in the gym do not train hard enough like the fact of the matter is is that i would guarantee that 99 percent of the people in the gym would start seeing results if they simply trained harder like it doesn't matter you don't need to have the perfect program you don't need to have like the perfect set of exercises like rest times and all this planned out but simply put, if you just trained hard enough you're gonna see some sort of change because you, if you're pushing your body hard enough you're gonna see growth and this is why a lot of people also ask like oh why do these people like like certain like bodybuilders or certain fitness people it's like oh why do these people like train like shit but they also have very impressive physiques and that's simply because even though they're not doing the perfect program or doing the perfect exercises they they're still pushing themselves so damn hard that they're still seeing results because they're pushing their body to that degree that you know their body has to adapt otherwise if it doesn't adapt then it won't uh, then they then their body just not doing anything but they're obviously they're pushing to that point enough that they're pushing their body to grow and their body like has to grow at that point but obviously i'm not saying to go in don't worry about form and just lift as much weight as possible and keep pushing yourself every single workout obviously part of that is a good thing but you want to be doing it intelligently as well you want to be doing it with good movements you want to be doing it with good form and you want to be progressing at an appropriate intensity and an appropriate time and factor all those things in and that's how you create a lifting journey that's both like very effective but also will last you a lifetime because if you can remain injury free or if you can reduce your chances of injury as much as possible you can do this thing longer you'll see more gains and yeah ultimately that's that's i think that's the ultimate goal is getting that longevity aspect that a lot of people are missing out on so yeah train hard don't be afraid to push yourself and a good rule of thumb is that you sh on a scale from one to ten with ten being you cannot force out another rep if you tried always aim for about a seven to nine for whatever uh, sets you are lifting with and basically as long as you kind of maintain that area of like discomfort then you'll you'll see a lot of growth but yeah the fact of the matter is most people do not train hard enough and you just have to just train harder and also force yourself to do more because if you don't go through that air that area of discomfort then you're not going to see change and now which this brings me to my next point about tempo setup and execution so this is basically just a fancy way so tempo is pretty much like the the speed that you're lifting the weight so if you think about like controlling the eccentric or controlling the negative portion of your lift that's going to be part of tempo and then if you incorporate any pauses that's also part of tempo and then how fast you lift the weight up that's also another part of tempo so tempo in terms of muscle growth it doesn't really do much but it just kind of helps you you know control the weight better and also helps you reduce your chances of injury because the more control you have over the weight obviously it you're gonna have less chance of injury because the more control you have that means the weight's not going to like do some funky movement on you and you like will reduce your chances of getting hurt because you just simply are able to control the weight and it's not going to put you in pro possible compromised positions and yeah and then next point here uh compound lifts versus isolation i did touch on this a little earlier so compound lifts are defined as lifts that work multiple muscle groups and obviously the more muscles you're working at one time the more fatiguing it's going to be this is why on specifically like leg days you'll find that you're super tired just from training legs because your legs are literally half your body and they're just bigger muscles that will require more nutrients and energy and all that so yeah simply put common lifts are going to be more fatiguing and this 
again, this depends on what you want to get out of your workout. Uh, you can definitely choose movements that target one specific muscle group a bit more. Like I said, if you want to maximize muscle growth, you have to be picking movements that target specific muscles to a high degree. Uh, but yeah, you can you can still definitely do a lot of compound lifts depending on what you want to get out of workout. If you just need to get a quick workout through, you can just do a lot of compound lifts, work out every single muscle group. And again, I'm not saying that you can't build muscle if you don't do any isolation, but us isolation can definitely help you get that added like extra volume, that extra stimulus to specific muscle groups that you want to focus on. But you can definitely get a lot of results from just doing compound lifts. But yeah, overall, if you want to maximize your results, do a combination of compound and isolation lifts. If you are like, like strapped on time and just really want to be efficient, just doing a lot of compound lifts will help with that. And then, you know, throwing in some isolation if you have time. But other than that, yeah, just focus on compounds but isolations are kind of like the, the icing on top. And let's see, that's about most of what I wanted to cover for the informative aspect of this podcast. And then the last one, last thing I do want to talk about, this is more about mindset and just addressing an FAQ that I get a lot. So what is the best way for you to learn how to find the workout that works best for you? And honestly, people think like, oh, I need to find the best workout program if I want to see the best results and I, f- I, I need to do all this like perfectly if I want to like get the most results or like they use that as an excuse to not get started or not do the thing that they know they need to do because they're always in search of quote like something perfect. But if, But the truth is, honestly, the best workout for you, the number one factor is if it's something you can sustain for the rest of your life and if it's also something that you enjoy doing. And this is something that we have to realize, especially as like as a trainer, like I, I wanna put everyone on the same like training style I do because I love that. But at the same time, I have to realize that people have different goals, people have different levels of enjoyment for certain like training styles. And I have to work around that and find out what is most sustainable and enjoyable for them and program around that. Because I feel like a lot of us tend to project what we want onto other people. And you have to also realize within yourself that you shouldn't be doing something just because someone else is doing it. You should be doing something that, you know, you enjoy, but also something that use results. It's kind of finding that balance that you don't, like, don't stick to, don't follow a specific program just because you want specific results or just because someone it's someone that you want to look like, but rather you have to question, you know, what results am I going to get? What results do I really want? And then use that for yourself as kind of a guide to building your workout program. And something else I want to address is that, you know, a lot of people in, in the age of social media, within especially within the past like five years or so, there has been a huge rise in swipe workouts i'm sure you've seen all over social media like tiktok and instagram people just showing random workouts and while it's good that these do help people get started into fitness and really you know get their feet wet and teach them a thing or two about exercise because a lot of people don't really have any knowledge when it comes to this and just having a set of exercises to do that's better than nothing better than sitting on the couch and figuring out like oh what do i do i don't know what to do but having like a set of like five to 10 exercises can definitely be helpful in, you know, helping people learn movement patterns and really get a thing for movement. But at the same time, like this should not be where your knowledge ends. I think that if you truly want to build the best workout program for yourself, you should spend some time learning about how your body works, learning about, you know, you don't, and again, you don't have to be taking some complex anatomy and physiology course, but at the same time, you can, For the most part, learn how your body works, just learning like the basic muscle groups, like your chest, your pecs, your your delts, your shoulders, your your lats, your upper back muscles, your glutes, hamstrings, quads, calves. Learn about how those structures are built in the body and how like what points are they attached to in the body, how they move the body and how 
And ultimately, just through learning that, you'll figure out, okay, so that means if this muscle does primarily this, and these are where the muscles are, that means this movement will target this muscle the best. And just by simply learning that, that'll help you a lot in understanding what movements to pick and why you should pick a certain movement over others and ultimately help you sort out through like the fitness BS because a lot of people can have their two cents on everything. And just because someone looks good doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about. So ultimately, I think it's up to you to kind of like build that knowledge for yourself so that, you know, you can scope out the BS if you see it and, you know, be better informed and not just blindly stick to someone's advice or someone's information just because they look a certain way or just because they say things in a certain way. But ultimately educating yourself improving that um that bullshit detector within yourself and then yeah ultimately you can do this thing on your own and do it sustainably and do it intelligently and lastly obviously if you have the time or money or the time and money definitely hire someone better and more knowledgeable than you and you know sometimes i get questions like these they're like oh how do you know so much and honestly i invested my time and money into working with people who are better than me and ultimately educating myself through that process and i think the number one thing is that accepting is it's having that humility that you don't know everything and that's the kind of mindset i went into like every time i learned something i'm like okay okay what is this information presenting is there any way that i could be wrong and just going to that mindset of yeah i could be wrong about this and this person could know more than me. So I'm going to take their advice, but I'm going to take it, obviously I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. I'm not going to like listen to every single thing I hear and like believe it a hundred percent, but I'm going to always be questioning what I know and, you know, how can I better improve this? And simply with that mindset, I was able to like, yeah, the first step is like literally accepting that wrong, that I'm wrong. Because if you never accept that you're wrong, then you're not going to get anywhere because you're going to be stuck in this like echoing chamber of the you're always right and all the knowledge that you have right now it's never going to get any better and it's going to be the same amount of knowledge that you know for the rest of your life which we know is not the case you know science itself is always growing always changing and ultimately that it comes from accepting that previous theories could be wrong and that's what causes like humankind and science and everything to move forward because we accept that we were wrong in the past and there are better ways to do things now. There are smarter ways to do things now. And yeah, ultimately, that's it. So, yeah, just don't, just don't always think that you're right. Have some humility and believe that you're able to be wrong. And if you have the time and money, definitely invest those resources into working with someone who is better and more knowledgeable than you. And again, you don't have to be working with this person forever. You can just use them however long or however much you're able to afford it and then you know take all the knowledge you've learned and use that knowledge to build more knowledge and it's basically just the process of you the the saying that you got to spend money to make more money and yeah honestly like hire a coach then that that's what i did and i've i'm learning so much i'm still learning so much and it's like ever growing and honestly my programming from last year to now it's like a completely different thing i have a completely different mindset i have a completely different way of going about things and honestly i think a year from today i my programming is going to be completely different also and this is because of the process that you know i accepted i could be wrong about certain things and i accepted that there probably is a better way of doing things and that's the better way that i should be probably doing and learning how to do and i basically accepted that and now my skills are better than before and that's simply because i i did all that i just said so yeah if you do want to better your knowledge invest your time and money into other people who are better than you at whatever it is you're trying to get better at and yeah that's ultimately the best piece of advice i have if you want to get better if you want to get smarter and yeah honestly a good coach will educate you on why they do think do specific things and especially if you're hiring and paying this person, they should be answering your questions. So yeah, that's that's it. I'll probably end it there. It's been quite a lengthy podcast, almost an hour now. So yeah, thank you so much. If you made it this far, 
Thank you so much for listening to me ramble on for the past hour. So yeah, if this podcast has helped you, be sure to leave a five-star review. Uh, written reviews help a lot too. It definitely lets me know that, you know, an actual person is leaving the review and actually uh, giving me a lot of feedback in terms of what they enjoyed, what I can improve on, all that. But yeah, thank you so much for listening and tuning in and I will catch you in the next one.